you don't know who Holland Davis is, you should, because you've probably sung at least one of his songs. You guys know, Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Holland wrote that song. Uh, and if you've ever sang it in your church, then you helped put food on his table. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully. Uh, Holland has also worked for Maranatha uh, for a while, Maranatha Music. And uh, there was a CD compilation series that came out called Wow Worship. You guys heard of Wow Worship? Uh, Holland's the one that created that, started that with his team and came from Maranatha. And now he's serving as a senior pastor at Worship Life, the Calvary Chapel down in San Clemente. Uh, and we're just really excited to have him here because he brings a wealth of knowledge not only from a ministry and church perspective, which is really important for us as music worship majors, but also from a business perspective, uh, which is really important for us as commercial music majors. And hopefully, we'll be able to tie both of them in as we listen to what Holland has to say. So let's welcome Holland. Well, that was, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, was, I spoke at a conference recently, and they introduced me as world-renowned. And uh, so they posted on Facebook. So I, I went to Facebook, and I said, you know, there's some guy with my name who's world-renowned, and he's going to be speaking at this place, so I'm going to go hear him, because I've never heard anyone like that before. And uh, so they in introduced me, and they said, have you guys heard of Holland Davis? And everybody was like, no. <laughs> that, was so, that was so awesome. I love that. Well, um, what I was asked to talk about tonight is just give you an idea, as you guys are going to be graduating from college and looking at being in music in some capacity, whether it's full-time or hopefully full-time, um, and I wanted to give you kind of a kind of a wide view of all the different ways, at least in my life, the journey that I've taken in, in having a career in music that's resulted in me, even, even in being a pastor, I still am involved in music uh, quite a bit. And, um, and so I've kind of broken it down into five areas um, that, you know, were... Uh, that my journey has taken me on, both in performance and production, publishing, promotion, and education. And so, to kind of help you, you know, maybe get a more realistic viewpoint of what it really takes to have a career in music, and also so you don't get discouraged along the way, thinking, wow, I really signed up for this, but now I end up doing this. And when I, you know, when I started out, I was um, 16. I was working at a Christian bookstore, and um, I got, they found out I played guitar, so they gave me, at that time, the only songbooks they had that were worship songs, which was um, a series of records called Praise 1 through 4 from Maranatha Music, and that's really all there was as far as contemporary worship uh, goes, and so that might date me. And so they said, learn these songs and come to our Bible study. And I learned those songs and came to my came to their Bible study, and I, uh, you know, basically uh, played those songs for about a month, and then they said we're going to start a church. It's going to be called Calvary Chapel Vista. Holland is our worship leader, and that's when I began my ministry in the area of worship. Now, um, at that time, I really didn't know what a worship leader was because there were no conferences. There was no way to define that term. All I did was I did, you know, I got up and sang these songs, and people cried, and it was amazing, and, you know, and they were goofy songs. I mean, there aren't even really cool songs like we had today. We were singing songs like, uh, Jesus' love is a bubbling over, uh, Jesus' loves bubbles in my soul. And that was one of our big hits. And then the, the, the ladies would sing, ba 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 No, the guys sing that, ba 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 So that's what they would sing and the girls would sing their part. That was the Holy Spirit ever got slayed when we did that song. Then we did another song that said, um, scratch your friend's back, scratch your back next to you, scratch your friend's back and sing la la. And the chorus was, uh, la 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 so that was as close to speaking in tongues as we got. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So, um, so that's actually what got me writing songs because I just 
hated those songs with Something. passion. And I just said, we need some songs that say what we want to say in our language, you know, at that time. And so we ended up singing, uh, you know, we ended up writing songs. And um, through the church that I was involved in, we had a lot of people would visit our church from different parts of the country. And those songs started going all around the world. You know, and it was all grassroots, all word of mouth. And so um, from there, you know, we started getting requests to teach people to, you know, to do what we were doing. They would visit our church. Hey, we want to learn what you guys are doing. And we would end up going and, and just talk about what we did. We didn't have real fancy language to describe it with. We really didn't even know what we were doing. <laughs> but we just shared the knowledge that we did have. You know, and that got us started teaching conferences and things like that. And so as it kind of progressed and grew, um, I was on, I don't know if you guys remember CompuServe. Uh, does anybody remember CompuServe? And they had the chat rooms in there. And they had a worship chat room on CompuServe. And I got to know a lady, um, boy, that sounds really bad. <laughs> um, it was a worship CompuServe chat room. And it was a lady that was employed by Maranatha Music, who was uh, an assistant to the A&R director. And um, I shared some of my songs through CompuServe, and she came and saw us uh, lead worship someplace and invited me to come to a meeting uh, for Maranatha Music. And, uh, and so I went up to this meeting, and they wanted us to give them feedback in this meeting on, um, on songs that they were going to release to the church. They wanted to know if we would play those songs. So it was like, you guys are worship pastors. Here's songs. Would you play them in your church? And then when we got there, they flipped the meeting and they said, you know, we can play this, our songs or we can listen to your songs. You know, so let's just go around the room and just share songs. And so they started that, they went around the room and they finally got to me and they asked me to share some songs. So I thought, wow, this is my big opportunity, right? And, that, and so I got all my hit songs out and I played all my hit songs for them and they were like, no, we don't like that. Um, do you have anything else? And I play another hit song and they're like, no, we don't like that either. Um, and I, after a while, I'm like, I don't think you guys are really in this to make money, are you? Like, you don't want to be in business, because you're like turning down all my hit songs. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a typical kind of artist thing, like, you don't get me. And, um, <laughs> and so they said, no, no, they said, do you have anything else? And I said, well, I have this one. It's not really a, a real song. It's an idea. And it just kind of happened at this small Bible study I did recently, and I played this song called Let It Rise. And as soon as I played that song, the whole room lit up. Everybody in the room says, that's the song. All the other worship leaders said, we would do that song. And so they said, we need that song by tomorrow. We're going in the studio with Paul Balash. He's gonna. We're doing a praise band seven. We want to put it on that record. And they put it on that record. Then they put it on Promise Keepers. Then they put it on... Um, a bunch of other records that year, and then that song just blew up and went all around the world. And, uh, and the funny thing is, is that I barely can even take credit for writing the song because it wasn't like I sat and did all the things you're learning probably. How many are in songwriting class right now? Composition? One of you? <laughs> all right, the rest of you want a minute? Um, or want to? Um, I didn't learn. All the stuff I learned in writing classes, you know, songwriting classes and stuff, I didn't use any of that to write that song. Um, it was truly a gift from the Lord, and it just came out the way that it, it, God gave it to me, you know. In fact, we were getting ready to lead worship for a, a Bible study at a coffee shop in Pacific Beach, and it was right on the beach. And so we're getting in here, and, and the ba my drummer couldn't make it, so the bass player says, I have a friend of mine, he's awesome, he's a great drummer, I'll bring him. I said, that's fine. And uh, so we, got, we started to get into it, and I'm realizing this drummer is terrible. And not only is he terrible, he didn't know any of the songs. So I turned around and said, are you a Christian? Because like, even if you go to church, you're going to hear some of these songs, right? And so he was like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I just don't listen to any of this music. And so inside I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a terrible night. You know, I'm a guest artist in a church and, you know, the drummer is terrible. And uh, which he heard me tell my story and he contacted me later and says, was I really that bad? <laughs> I said, well, what are you doing now? He goes, now I'm a sound man. I said, well, that answers your question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyhow, um, 
he, you don't know him, do you? No. <laughs> but uh, so we we go through this evening, and we're getting ready to to start. And I'm just in the back room, and we're praying, and I'm starting to play the chords to let it rise. It was, God was just kind of giving me these chords, and I'm just like. In my heart, I'm just praying, you know, it's more of a desperation, like, Lord, if you don't show up right now, if you don't change the atmosphere in this place, if you don't do something, this is going to be a disaster. You have got to, your glory's got to rise up somehow, just worship's got to rise, something's going to happen. And so, um, I turned around to the band right before we started, and the pastor was praying, I said, just play these chords. And they're looking at me and says, and in my mind I'm thinking, you don't know any of the other songs. So, I mean, just one more song you don't know isn't going to kill us. And so I just said, just play these chords. We played these three chords. And I turned around and I started singing, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the, let the, and, and all of a sudden, the drummer got healed. He could, <laughs> and, you know, the bass player, I mean, it just all came together. And it was this incredible night of worship. But that, you know, it's kind of a blend between keyboard and other instruments or no instrument at all. Um, and so that's really where the church market is right now. Um, they prefer male worship leaders that play guitar. And uh, that isn't a slam against anything. You can change the world because you're the next generation. You can do whatever you want. And uh, But that's just kind of reflecting uh, what is happening now. This is from a, a recent... Um, uh, survey from Worship Leader Magazine. Age-wise, 27% are in their 40s, 26% um, are in their 50s, and 25% are in their 30s. And so, um, that what this, when I see a thing like that, what, what does that tell me? That tells me within the next 5 to 10 years, there's going to be a lot of worship leading positions available. You know, because there's going to be a transition coming. The other thing it means is that 54% do not fit. <laughs> so um, it's just a it's just a reality. Um, and I'm being, <laughs> I'm being reminded these days that I shouldn't even try. Uh, so there's just a point. Thank you. Um, 20% are volunteers, 24% um, are paid under 30k a year, which means they're part-time. Um, so that means that nearly half the jobs that are available out there are basically part-time or volunteer positions. And so that's just a reality of what you're looking at. Um, over 30% are full-time and that they're 30 to 60k per year, you know, so that's what is considered a full-time salary. Um, only about 1% are paid over 100000 a year. Um, I was blessed to have, being the 1% for just a short period of time, um, but it was, you know, it was a, it was a very, it, I would recognize it was a very special time. So, if you have those kinds of opportunities, just realize that that is a, a tremendous door that God is opening for you. And only about 13% of the churches in America pay their musicians. So it's just, you know, regardless of what, you know, if you go to a big church currently, you might have a different view of that. And, but I'm, I'm helping you understand that even in big churches, many of them are starting to cut back and, and move more towards a volunteer base. Um, and, in the, in, uh, and when you get outside of Southern California, it's, a, it's just a dramatic reality. Most churches do not pay their uh, musicians unless they're in leadership. Yeah. Um, now, uh, two questions actually. The one percent for the one that the worship leaders that make a hundred k, are they the, their skill set? Is it usually just God moving at you know an incredible time, or is their skill set to match that hundred k salary? Like, are those the worship leaders that, on top of that, they actually know their instrument inside and out pretty well, and they can you know actually? It depends on your movement. You know, if you're in a um, if you're in a, like a liturgical movement, you know, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Anglican, or if you're in a, um, uh, like a, a movement that is really education based, like, Pres uh, well, Presbyterian, um, you know, Baptist or some of the mainline denominations, 
then um, it there'll probably be a, a degree requirement and a proficiency requirement on your, on your instrument, that sort of thing. If you're in a, more of a contemporary modern church that's either charismatic um, or something like that, they tend to uh, base their decision making uh, on what they call anointing. You know, and um, the concept of anointing is, you know, there's there's a spiritual concept of it. What I've kind of discovered is that when people says it's anointed, it means they like it. Um, <laughs> if it's not anointed, that means they don't like it. Um, it just means that they don't know what it means to be anointed. Um, but that whole idea of anointing is, you know, if like for instance, Lincoln Brewster, when he where he's at. You know, he's a proficient musician. Um, he's a record. He's made records, and so he gets a salary. You know, in that range, just to be there part time, essentially. Um, and so sometimes they're looking for star power. If you've actually done something um, that would be a draw for the church, then they'll kind of bring that kind of a salary. In. So does that help answer your question? Yeah, that helps. Out. And I have one more last question. Now, as far as churches not paying the musicians. Um, why does it be like that? Because if I was a carpenter and I carpented the whole church, you know, they say, "Oh, I'm not going to." Well, it's volunteer work. Praise God, it's ludicrous. You know, I'm not saying, "Well, I'll, I'll go to God." I mean, I, I I work as a worship leader and I, I serve and do for free and make service to the Lord. But at the same time, I just I don't like that part where they say, "Oh, but just because you're a musician means you know you can't win." You know, musicians work extremely hard to hone their craft as well. Just, right. Just like an accountant. Again, it really depends on your tradition, you know, because um, in certain traditions, uh, even the role of music in the church isn't is subservient to what they would consider to be the pastor or the teaching role. So they would look at music as a subservient role to the word, so that they would hire teachers before they would hire even a music director. And I know many churches that are very what they would call word-based churches where the worship department is all volunteer, you know, but they but they make sure that all their teaching pastors are paid, you know, and it has to do with the about their particular tradition. Um, other traditions, uh, other churches, you know, if you consider the fact that the average church in America is around 90, you know, that's the average size, um, most of them can barely cover the cost of their senior pastor, you know, and maybe a part-time, you know, assistant. So it's sometimes, you know, they're doing everything they can to pay their worship leader like 500 bucks a month, you know, just to come and, and help out. So, um, so to add more onto that, they just physically can't do it. Not that they're opposed to it, it's just a financial kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, it's also been my experience that um, for volunteer musicians, they consider that tithing as well. That instead of paying you by donating your musical time to the church and things, they, they consider that your tithe to oh, the church. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So moving on, there's also then uh, just kind of, this is just my little thing about worship leaders. What is the role of a worship leader? Um, as I said earlier, my first assignment was Calvary Chapel Vista. I was 16. The only qualifications I had is I played guitar and I could sing in tune and I could learn their songs. I mean, that is literally the only qualification. It was a volunteer position. You know, but I did uh, um, all their midweek studies. I did all their Sunday mornings and I'm sure they worked me to death. And also as the youth pastor at 16, um, which I would never recommend that. <laughs> In fact, I can't, I can't understand why they thought that was a good idea. Um, at 16, I was also the youth pastor. Um, but how I look at worship leading is it's really a pastoral gift. It's not necessarily a musical function as much as it's a pastoral function. And that you're using artistic expression to pastor people with. So you're using song selection, your prayers, song presentation, or drama. Or if you're involved in, if you're in a position where you're overseeing dramatic arts or media forms, you know, video production. Um, at one church, I was over um, uh, all drama, all video production, all the um, all the musical production, all vocal production, and all, and also any recording that we did. I was in charge of the stu recording studio, uh, so it was a big job. And um, and so, but all of the the goal of all of those things was to 
use the arts to pastor people um, along with what, what, however God was used, was speaking to our pastor at that time. The message that was coming through the pastor, we would highlight that through the arts. Um, and so our goal was, as a worship leader, was to facilitate sung prayer. And, um, and so I see worship as our prayer set to music. And so when we're leading worship, we're functioning as prayer leaders. So we're facilitating the prayers that are inside the hearts of people. And, um, and so that's why song selection is so important, because we want to be connected to the community um, so that we can give voice to what's happening within the community. Um, which is also why songwriting is so important uh, if you're part of, uh, if you're a worship leader within a community because you, as a part of that community, are going to be better equipped to give voice to what God is speaking uh, in and through that community as a songwriter, you know, as a psalmist for that community. Um, it's a, it's a long-term community-based position to be a worship leader of a community because it's relational. You're going to be connected to people. Uh, and it's a pastoral occupation. So that's kind of how I look at the position of, of being a worship leader. Um, again, the qualifications depend on the church or the denomination, proficiency on instrument, proficiency with administration. Um, the larger the ministry, the less you tend to do in the creative side and the more you tend to do on the administrative side. And so a couple of the jobs that I was involved in were it was more administrative than even creative because we were dealing with such large groups of people and trying to keep everyone together and going in the right di direction. Um, a music degree may or may not be necessary. You know, um, I don't have a music degree. I actually have a counseling degree. I went to UCSD to get a music degree, um, and uh, but my dad thought that I would never make it as a musician. <laughs> And uh, so he said, I, the only thing I'll pay for is a business degree. So I, under duress, changed my degree to accounting. And, um, and I flunked out of the program because, um, I'm just going to tell you everything. Uh, because uh, I thought, I don't want to know what you do. I'm going to hire you. I don't want to know what you do. You know? So, um, and so I fell asleep in class, and I flunked out of it, and so I thought I was so messed up, I went and got my counseling degree, and, uh, and learning how to help people, and that's probably what led me to be a pastor, but, um, but that's kind of what happened with me, um, and Bible college may or may not be necessary, you know, in a lot of the contemporary churches, it really comes down to gift-based, and, and whether, you, whether people are really drawn in by what you do, you know. And so um, I love the fact that, that uh, Azusa Pacific has a great, not only a great music program, but they have a great um, uh, worship leading emphasis to it where they're uh, bringing in a pastoral emphasis, uh, a spiritual formation emphasis, and which goes really nicely hand in hand with uh, worship leading. So um, that's the worship leading part. Then there's artist-based music. And this is uh, Switchfoot, the guys there. Um, my One of my very first uh, assignments I did with Maranatha the Music is we uh, did a bookstore thing up in uh, somewhere around here. And Switchfoot had just released their very first record, and they came, and they were the in-store band. And they we just hung out because no one really came uh, to the bookstore <laughs> to see any of us. And so uh, we were just hanging out together. Uh, back in the day, Drew, which is this other guitar player here, was in a band called All Together Separate. Uh, back in the day, some friends of mine too, and so I uh, really love these guys. Um, the reality with commercial music as a performer, 10 to 15 percent of all bands actually make it. That means 85 to 90 percent of the bands you'll never hear. Uh, you'll never hear what they do. Uh, and 50 percent of all musicians uh, within the music profession make 24 to 60 K per year that's the, with the average being around 40,000 a year so if you're a musician drummer bass player singer or whatever um, the average is about 40,000 a year the bottom 10% make less than 17,000 per year and the top 10% make uh, over a hundred thousand per year so if you think you know like I'm, I'm gonna really go for it in, co in the commercial music side of things um, you got to realize that there's a Billboard Top 100. 
So you're competing for the top 100 slots, you know, to be heard on the radio, uh, or the top 200 slots. And that's really what gets the attention. Out of thousands of bands, 200 get the attention. Now, when I was the A&R director for Maranatha Music, and I had people, very talented people, uh, come from all over the country, all over the world, to say, hey, I'm the next Michael W. Smith, I'm the next, you know, third day or whoever, and, and you've got to put me on your label. Um, the criteria that we looked at was so small, you know, because we, you know, we knew what the market could handle at the time, we knew what they were looking for, and, um, and you know, it's interesting because with a, a show like American Idol, you know, a lot of people mock that show, but if you pay attention to some of the things that they're looking for, it really is what music guys are looking for. So when you put, pitch a product to them, it's not just your sound, it's not just how well put together the music is, it's not just the quality of the song, it's the whole package. How do you look, how do you sound, how do you talk, how do you act on stage? They're really looking at the whole thing. You know, do you photograph well, do you video well? So it's such a narrow group of people that really get to make it into that world. Um, and so that's just the reality um, of, the, of the music profession on that level. Um, there's me from 1979 with my little band. Uh, of course, you heard of us, right? No. <laughs> we didn't make it. <laughs> um, but artist-based music is probably one of the most challenging ways to, uh, to go for um, being in Christian music, which is why a large number of, of Christian bands are now worship pastors. You know, uh, or they either began in ministry, um, the, uh, like the guys from Big Daddy Weave, he was the worship leader for the youth group. And then they, and then they were discovered, and, and, uh, and when he's not on the road, he's the worship leader of the youth group. Or actually, he's now the youth, the more of, of a leadership role. Um, but a lot of the, you know, Chris Tomlin started out as a worship leader in, in a little church in Texas. And um, he got hooked up to the youth ministry at Texas A&M called Choice Ministry Resources. And it was a guy, but it was a guy leading it with his wife, and they would do the worship, Louis and Shelley Giglio. And they were the worship leaders, and Chris would show up with the drum machine and play, you know, put his drum machine on and play with his acoustic guitar. And um, they struck up a friendship, and, you know, he just kind of followed Louis wherever he went, and um, he's, was the, he's been the worship leader of a church consistently, uh, Chris has. Since, um, since his college days. He's never not been a worship leader of a church. In fact, all of the top um, selling Christian worship leaders that you hear on the radio today are still worship leaders at their churches. Um, David Crowder um, was at Baylor University until recently. He's at um, Passion City Church now. Um, uh, Tommy Walker is still the worship leader at Christian Assembly. Paul Walosh, uh, still leads worship at his church in, Wake, in um, not Waco, um, oh, I forget the name of the town. It's the YWAM base there in Texas. Um, anyhow, he's still the worship leader of his church to this day. Matt Redman leads worship at a church in Wattsford, England. Uh, Tim Hughes is the worship leader at Holy Trinity Brompton. You know, so they're all involved in local uh, church-based um, worship. And what they do as, you know, traveling artists is completely, you know, in addition to their worship leader functions. And, um, but all of them have never left Sunday morning worship um, to do what they're doing outside of that. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, uh, have you met Sean McDonald? I haven't met Sean McDonald. should I really approach um, trying to market myself so that way I might be able to reach people, make a connection with them, and then, you know, present them to the Lord my Christian because if they don't want to even get to know me or they don't want to even have anything to do with me, I can't even give them my message. So how, how's the best way to scope a possible, how do you, how do you spot a, pers uh, a prospective market and then go for it? Well, 
actually right now the um, it's a very unique time in our market because it's way more open than what people realize. Um, because the 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 key right now is indie independent. So um, and so you can without the the help of a record company you can be known by thousands of people if people like what you do just on an independent basis. And I know a number of bands that are traveling on work tour, they're on the work tour, they're on different tours with you know on mainstream and they're playing in front of thousands of people and they're all independent bands not signed to any labels. Um, and so really it's really in the favor of the artists right now to a lot of degrees, you know. Um, are they guys that are uh, making a lot of money doing it? Not really. Um, but they're able to fulfill their passion and their dream. And they're able to build their fan base. And that's the most important thing. If you're going to sign to a record label, for instance, um, typically a label doesn't sign an artist that's over uh, 30 years old. You know, because they're, they're looking at a limited shelf life and market. They're going to spend a lot of money on someone. Um, but they, I've seen them break the rules on a couple of occasions because the person that they were signing had a mailing list of forty to 60,000 names. That means that when they make a record, 40,000 people will buy their record. You know? And that in and of itself is a really great fan base if you've got something built up like that. And that's without a record company. You can do that just by playing places and being in front of people. And that's really the key if, to make it in commercial music, is just to be in front of as many people as you can. Um, once you get signed to a label, it does put you in front of more people because it opens up a lot of other opportunities that you wouldn't um, normally have, like radio and television and that sort of thing. But most of us you know, can get in front of people um, a lot easier than it used to through YouTube and some of the... Um, uh, social networks, Facebook, and stuff like that. All the A&R people I know, they're looking for bands on Facebook right now. They're looking at, at, for bands on YouTube, and that's how they're finding um, new talent. And so that would be the way to do it, is make a big scene and then record it on video or have your friends record it and have them talk about it. Now, um, moving on to production. Um, this is another area uh, that you could make uh, a living in, um, and that's in the area of production. There's basically two forms that production can take. One is an event production. Um, this is passion this year. Um, but event production is one area that you can really you know, have, um, have a go at. And they're more technical, you know, based, you know, as, besides being the talent on the, on the platform, you know, if you get involved in audio, front of house mixing, monitor mixing, live recordings, there's lighting, video projection, live broadcast, which is television, um, internet streaming, stage design, and tour support, which is basically just going alongside and setting up equipment. And so, a, a lot of folks and just trying to be around people. Um, one thing I should say about music is that it's a very people-oriented business. It's all about friends and making friends and keeping those relationships long term. You know, all the things I've done in music has been through my friendships with people. You know, like I was at Maranatha, then I found then I found out they're at Vineyard, then I found out they're at Integrity, then I found out they're at you know Worship Together or they're at another company. And and as soon as they went to that company, then we started a relationship. You know, we started doing things together. So. It's all about having relationships. And so sometimes people will do things just to be around the people they want to be around and to be able to develop those relationships. In event-driven uh, production, they're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for interns, for people that want to come and learn. Um, they're not going to be real quick to just you know, give you the inf all the information you want to know up front. They'll want to get to know you. Before they share their secrets with you, they want to they want to get to know who you are, uh, and so there's uh, all kinds of stuff in live event production. Um, then there's also studio production. Um, studio production is a totally different world than live event production. And sometimes people will say, you know, hey, I can mix sound. I, you know, I can do studio work. I, you know, mix live sound. When you get in a studio, it's totally different. 
uh, because you have you don't have any ambient sound. It's just a completely different environment. Everything you hear has to be created. Um, so all the natural sound you hear in a live event has to be recreated in the studio event. Um, and so there's uh, different positions, basically doing the same things but different names. You know, you have the studio engineer. His job is to is to capture sound as naturally and as authentically as possible. And, and he's, you know, in a sense, it's like the sound tech. Um, then you have the studio musicians. In the studio situation, um, the studio musicians have a stable income. You know, they're the guys that can, uh, that, you know, they're always going to have work, especially if you have projects going on. Uh, the producer is usually the connector guy, the guy that knows all the people can bring them all together. And so the reason why you would go with a certain producer is because, you know, he knows a certain group of musicians that you want to have be a part of your project, or he knows people in the business that he can show your project to. Um, the executive producer is the money guy. He's just the guy that pays for everything. Um, and so you want to get to know executive producers uh, a lot. <laughs> get to know all the money people you can. And again, unpaid internships are, are real common in the studio. Um, it's great if you can get a paid internship. Um, but most of them are like, just come and hang out in the studio. And usually they'll pay you by giving you free recording time or something like that. Um, but if you can do something like that and you can learn from a really good engineer, you know, of all the people that are here, the person I want to know is the engineer. Uh, because the engineer is knows how to make the magic of the equipment happen, and they know how to get the sound you want. And um, I, 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 the person I did list on here is the guy that mixes the record. Uh, there's also an, another position, the guy that masters the record. So the guy that mixes the record is going to take everything that has been recorded, and he's going to turn it into a sound. He's going to make it uh, into something. And these days the sound and took this very raw rock sound and turned it into a modern, you know, kind of a modern worship sound. It was incredible what he did. Um, and then the mastering is another process in that. Um, and mastering, there's a few places in LA, there's more coming, there's more opening all the time. But mastering uh, places tend to get a reputation because you can really make or break a record in the mastering process. And so you want to make sure you go to someone um, that's really, really good at what they do and has a good reputation for what they do, that you've heard their work, you know. So we took their record to the mastering lab and we went into the room that U2 does all their mastering in, and so we got the same kind of treatment that a U2 record um, gets. Um, only 6% of a musician's revenue comes from studio productions. So it's just a reality check. Everyone wants to make a record, and they'll spend a lot of making money making a record, but only 6% of your revenue stream comes from <coughs> musical productions. And at the end, I'll give you a breakdown on, on how that happens. So that's production. Then there's another area called publishing. And uh, publishing is, uh, is where you get involved in songs, and it's more the accounting side. It's part of the accounting side of... Uh, an administrative side of music, um, but a good publisher is a very <coughs> relational person because they get to know the artists, they get to know the songwriters. Um, this is my friend Kim Hill here, and she's. Um, th they, this was a, a, an event that her publisher put together, uh, where they brought together different songwriters, and they had a songwriters in the round, and they were just kind of writing songs for different <coughs> things. Um, but uh, in publishing, you get involved in copyright management, which, has, which basically means you get a song, you register it with uh, the government, you register it with CCLI, you register it with you know, uh, CSAC or ASCAP or BMI, one of the performing rights organizations. And you make sure that the artist gets paid for their music. Um, royalty collection uh, means you're collecting royalties from all the different places. And, uh, and you make sure that they get paid, actually get paid, because there's a lot of songs that get used, but no one gets paid. You know, that's why on YouTube, you know, if you, if you uh, take a song, one of your favorite songs, you put it on a video, and then later, like, you go to YouTube and your song's been taken off. You know, you can see the picture, but there's no music, because they, they cut it off because the publisher 
complain. You know, so that's they're looking out for their artists that way. Um, licensing songs for TV commercials and film. That's a that's actually a fun thing. Um, a friend of mine's son is Tim Meyer. I don't know if you've heard of the song "Life Is Beautiful." It was a Target commercial um, a couple years ago, and it was also the theme song for the Olympics. It was kind of a cool thing. So that one song basically has set Tim Myers for life. And, um, but he went to a publisher that pitched it to Target for a commercial, and the rest is history. He started a band called One Republic, and he quit the band to do this instead. So, um, so for him, it's been very lucrative to be involved in licensing songs for TV and film. Um, but he did that through his publisher. Um, there's a and R, which is looking for new talent. Um, it stands for artists and repertoire, um, but we used to joke and say it stands for airports and restaurants because we spent a lot of time <laughs> restaurants taking people out to dinner. In fact, uh, when I signed, I was uh, I signed David Crowder to his first record deal. Um, we started a label at Maranatha Music called Worship Underground, and he he had a record called All I Can Say. And so to celebrate, he came out to California. And he ate at the, um, we ate together at the fish place on the pier in San Clemente, and we went and saw Star Wars at midnight. So uh, that was how we celebrated. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's how it should be. Um, or there's also being, getting involved in the legal side of things, where there's copyright law, becoming a music attorney, and that's all usually affiliated with the publishing side of the world. Um, now, the other area is uh, promotions. Now, oh, let me go back. So when I was involved in the music business, um, I started out as a performer, um, but really got my intro was in promotions. I went in as the marketing director for Maranatha Music. Um, and then through that, got involved in production and then eventually in A&R and, and that kind of thing. So. My career path has gone through a, a lot of different changes within the music world, you know. So just something to keep in mind is that, just to be open. Um, one of the things we're involved in is retail marketing. And um, when I was with Maranatha, we started a partnership with Integrity Music, Vineyard Music, and Worship Together. And we started a, pro, uh, a compilation called Wow Worship. And we did three, uh, the orange, the blue, and the green. And, um, and that was extremely profitable. That, that series brought worship music out of the church into the mainstream. And that was one of, our, one of our things behind it is we wanted to see how do we take worship, which, you know, if you went to vineyard churches, you knew what vineyard worship was. If you, um, if you went to uh, uh, Pentecostal churches, you knew what integrity music was. If you were in Calvary chapels, you knew what Maranatha music was. But if you didn't go to church, you didn't know what worship was. You know, really people weren't aware of worship in the mainstream general marketplace. And what we found, what, when we did statistics, we found out that most people who are Christians don't go to Christian bookstores to buy music. And so, if, you know, if most Christians don't go to Christian bookstores to buy music, then we want to be where the Christians are, which are in the mainstream. So we created Wild Worship, and um, it, it, the first, I th think the, all of them have gone platinum, which they've done really well. But it really changed worship in, um, in our nation because it took worship into the mainstream. So it took it into Target, Walmart, and it really gave it a real presence. It was on TV. Yeah? How would you get paid off of a WOW album? How much would you get paid? Uh, yeah, if you were an artist, say you had one song in a WOW album, but it went platinum. Um, you know, how do you get paid off of that? Well, the royalty rate on, well, this was a, we did reduce royalty because it was it was 30 song compilation. So it was a 75% of normal, which nine, now today's, it would be nine and a half cents. So 75% of that would be, what, like six cents? Yeah. Um, and then you are six or seven cents. So, and then, um, so it'd be seven cents per unit. And then to go platinum on a double compilation is 500,000 units times seven cents. And then you would divide that in half because most publishing deals are 
are, well, you divide it in half because the, um, yeah, most publishing deals are the publisher gets half and the writer gets half. So it would be half of seven times 500,000. So that'd be 35,000 divided by two. So 17, five. This is pretty good for not having to do the work of an album. I mean, you just got one song for the Wow album. Right? Yeah. It's a blessing, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> it was a blessing. But retail marketing involves a lot more than books. Retail marketing, this was an ad for it. So retail marketing, you're going to get involved in putting ads together, putting you know things that sell albums in stores. And so we develop sales programs. I, I developed a program called Follow the Star. So you would go into a bookstore and you would see a star hanging over the music section. You would follow the star. And underneath the star would be all the Maranatha records with special discounts. And we put ads in papers and stuff and got people to go in bookstores and buy Maranatha music. And so you're always doing things that are gonna uh, present people um, you're doing, you know, now today's day, you know, the, the marketing strategies have changed because it's primarily social marketing is your biggest, you know, focus now. And so, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, you know, being live at event and, and, and being able to involve people in events in, a very, in real time, even though they're not at the event, that's like a critical way of marketing now. And so marketing has changed to some degree, but it's still an exciting thing. For me, I, I, I really like uh, doing marketing. Um, then there's radio promotions. And radio promotions is all about getting radio stations to play a song. And, um, and there really is a strategy to getting songs on the radio. It's not like you send a CD. You know, it used to be like you drive to a radio station, you get your guitar out, you play for the DJ, he puts you on the radio because he likes you. Um, now it's very specific, you know, because they, um, it's a it's big business. And so um, it's very difficult to like get on the fish, it's very difficult to get on a lot of the mainstream um, radio stations unless you have a lot of marketing dollars behind you. Um, some radio stations, um, and I'm always talking as much as I can to radio promoters, is to try to get it back to the way it was a little bit, where they're breaking new talent. And so some stations will do that. The Fish will do that for, on occasion, not on a regular basis, but they'll do it. Um, the, the family radio out in um, uh, the Inland Empire, um, they do more of it. They're probably more open because they're, you know, they're not controlled by a huge conglomeration. Um, and so the independent stations will be more open to that, but the, the more corporate run stations that are like Salem Broadcasting and those kind of things, they're less open to that just because they've got so much pressure on them to, you know, it's, it's really about charting songs and all that sort of thing. So like the, the year that Let It Rise won, I think we charted number three in the nation with wow. that song. You know, but it was a very strategic um, thing that they went through to get the, the song to chart at that level, to get people to listen to it and all that sort of thing. So that's a whole strategy. And here's the thing I'll tell you about all these, this side of the equation as far as the promotional side. They're the nicest people in the world. They, they will talk to you, they'll be your buddy. They will not tell you anything about what they do. Uh, and so, <laughs> Uh, I learned this the hard way because you know when I took when I showed up on uh, as the A and R or the marketing director for Marinot the music and I started calling people and you know, like Word Music and EMI and all these guys introducing myself. It's like, hey, you know, how are you guys doing? And you know, hey, we get to get together and share ideas and like, you know, no, we don't do that. You know, they don't <laughs> share ideas. They don't. They're not in, there's, there's no love in that way. You know? <laughs> so everything I learned, I had to learn by trial and error. I had to learn it kind of the hard way. Um, that's why if you can get an internship with a company, um, that's the best way to learn, because you're gonna learn what they do. And as you get to know people, you know, there's, there, it's not rocket science, it's not hard, um, but there is some, but there is a lot of relationship. Relationships are built up over years. And, um, and so if someone has a friend that they can call up and say, hey, could you put this, you know, put my CD on? Or, hey, could you, you know, would you mind giving me an end cap and featuring it in your store for a while? You know, those relationships are golden. They're worth a lot. And so, and those aren't easily earned and they're not easily given up. 
And so if you can get involved in an in a internship with someone, um, that's, a, that's a great way to learn it. Uh, the other way is event marketing. Um, I was involved in marketing Promise Keepers events when I was with Grand Opera Music. And so we developed the ad campaigns, we developed uh, how they were going to market, we developed uh, all the looks for the events uh, every year. And it was a, a huge undertaking, you know, it was something, how do you, how do you get guys to fill stadiums? How do you do all of that sort of thing? How do you get the word out? And so, um, and so that's another area. Again, nobody will tell you anything. So um, now there's Eventbrite. Um, but there's just things that you can learn just by doing it, trial and error, and, or being involved in an internship pro program uh, in a company. Um, another area is song promotion. And this is something I still do. Um, we started a website called worshipsong.com, which is purely for song promotion for independent writers. Um, after coming out of the Christian music industry and seeing how very limited it was, um, you know, it's very limiting for writers, it's li very limiting for songs, and one of the things that I discovered is that no matter what you do, a church is going to self-select. Um, they're they're going to be the filter anyhow. So worship leaders and churches are going to be the ones that decide what songs are going to do. So I thought, let's take the let's just take the um, the filter away. Let's take the record company filter away. Let the churches decide themselves. So we created this song. So songwriters post their songs, and worship leaders from all over the world can listen to the songs, and then they decide what songs they're going to put in their churches. Um, we had four hundred thousand, over four hundred thousand songs listened to last year, um, just word of mouth. So it's it's not a it's not a bad little number. And it's growing. We have a growing catalog. Now we have um, Bethel Music has their songs on there. Vineyard UK has their songs on there. Um, Christ for the Nations, Calvary Chapel Music has their songs on there. So there are all ways to, you know, to get songs heard by other people. And so if you're a song promoter, the whole job is to get an artist, to get somebody to hear the song so that they'll record it. And I'm Pretty, I'm involved in uh, publishing still, so we do we offer publishing and uh, administration rights uh, on the site, and uh, and so we're always filtering requests for songs that people have heard on the site and says, hey, can we record this um, on our CD at our church, and and we've seen that uh, develop as, as well. So that's an area of music um, promotion uh, to be involved in. A lot of times, the publisher assumes that role. So that is promotions. And then the fifth area is education. And education has to do with, with teaching other people you know, what you do. In formal education, you have to have a degree to teach in a formal institution. Uh, music lessons, you, know, you don't necessarily have a degree, but you gotta know what you're doing, you gotta have experience. Um, and if you do workshops and conferences, there has to be some kind of recognition uh, behind what you've done, but it's but it, uh, oftentimes what happens is uh, you know once people get a, a level of success, then they'll start doing workshops and conferences. You know if they have a degree, then they can go right into formal education. Um, and a lot of times, if they have you know if they're proficient on their instrument, then they'll then people will start wanting to take lessons from them. Now here's kind of the reality of how people make music in the, or money in the music industry. Um, this is coming from um, one of the royalty collecting streams. I can't remember which one it was. But the um, touring uh, shows live performance fees is about 28% of an average musician's income stream, a working musician. 22% comes from teaching. 19% comes from a salary as an employee of a symphony band or ensemble. Um, session musician earnings is about 10%, um, 7%, other 6% from songwriting and musical composition. Uh, money from sound recordings, about 6%, merchandise sales, about 2%. So this is the average, this applies to the average musician. So if you go like, what about Faith Hill? Okay, well, she's in the one percentile, <laughs> you know, that makes more than all of us, or the top ten percent, and she makes a lot more on her songs. Uh, but you, if you probably broke down her her 
or income, it would start probably would look like this. Her numbers would just be a lot bigger in each of those different areas. And she probably doesn't teach. She doesn't have to do that. Um, but if you're looking at the whole idea I want you to get from this, though, is um, you're, you're going to look at multiple streams, multiple um, sources of income in order to have a career in music. So currently, I, I work in publishing still, so I get an income from publishing. Um, I get an income as a songwriter still, because my songs are, are generate royalties. Um, I also get an income, uh, uh, well, now I'm a senior pastor, but prior to that, I got an income from working at a church. Um, and so that was a part of it as well. Um, I got an income from teaching, so as I would go out and do, and do um, conferences and workshops and uh, those kinds of avenues, I would uh, generate income that way. I've never taught music lessons, um, and that's really uh, just a merciful act on the people that would come to me. Because uh, <laughs> I'm just not, I'm not great in that area. Um, but, uh, but, but my revenue stream has always come from multiple sources. You know, so I never looked at uh, my musical career as just having you know, one single stream of income. And most people I know that are making a living, I, I have a friend that um, uh, does musical composition for Blizzard. And so he wow. makes, he's doing you know, orchestral things. He gets to do stuff at Capitol Records and they do the, they use the orchestra room. It's, it's just all this fun stuff. But he's also producing. He's, uh, he also gets income from publishing. He's, he has different income streams, not just that one area of his um, job. You know, so he's got different things coming in. Um, so, here's some, a few tips. Uh, like I said, as you notice, it takes several income streams to make a living in music. And so you want to be open to new opportunities. Um, you want to always keep an open mind, keep an open hand, um, even if it's not in the field you want to end up in. You know, you, you might have to walk through a few fields to get to where you're going. And so you always want to be open to kind of that direction. Um, be easy to work with. You know, don't be a drama person. Um, you're, especially like in some of these environments, you're like in a closed room for like long time <laughs> with people. And if you're not a good hang, then you're not a good hang, you know. So you want to be a good hang um, because music is a friendship business. It's all about making friends and doing things with your friends, um, creating with your friends. Um, I don't like to create with people that, you know, just just because I think, oh, you're great, we're going to do something. I like to work with my friends. And so if I'm going to write songs, I'm going <coughs> to call up one of my friends, you know, and, and, and say, hey, you want to write a song? Or if, you know, I'll, and sometimes I'll open that up and, and say, hey, let's try something if I've never worked with someone. But generally, I'll fall back on the people that I'm comfortable with, you know. So it's a friendship business. <coughs> um, you want to be on time and you want to be under budget. So everything you do, you want to be on time. The whole thing, like musicians are always late. You're only late once. <coughs> After that, you're fired. Um, and so it's, you, it's like there's so much talent out there. They want to work with the talent that's easy to work with, that it's just that everything they do. In fact, um, I have some friends that were in a band called Pax 217. They were a couple of guys were on my worship team. And... Um, and they worked with the secular, their last record, they worked with a secular music producer. And the guy just fell in love with them because they were so easy to work with. And he did all kinds of extra stuff for them. He just, he just, you guys are so easy to work with. You show up, you're like, I don't have any hassles with you. You're not doing drugs. And it's just awesome. And so he did all, he went overtime for these guys just because he just loved working with them so much. Um, be amazing at what you do. Whatever you do, be amazing at it. Don't just go in, even if it's something that you've never done before, go in with the attitude that you're just going to be amazing at it. Um, practice makes permanent. You know, you've heard that practice makes perfect? No. It makes permanent. Whatever you do, whatever you practice, it's going to be permanent. So practice being amazing. And, uh, and that will be uh, permanent for you. 
and be creative in everything you do. There's some times when, when people don't want creative, they just want the job done. But a lot of times in a creative environment, they want creative. They want you to come up and see things that they don't see. Um, we came up with a product design for a series called the Top 25 Praise Songs with Maranatha Music. And, um, and it was real simple how I got it. I just went into a record store and there was the billboard top 10 things. And there was nothing like that for worship. And I thought, why don't we do a top 25? No one's ever attached it to CCLI, so let's just take the CCLI list and make it the top 25 CCLI, CCLI list. And so we did that, and we did it for um, $17,000 is what we made the record for. Um, and it was budgeted for $15,000. Um, it was all midi out, you know, it was a guy, a friend of mine, Smitty Price, and he, you know, we had people from the office singing on it, you know, it was a real budget record, because we didn't know, it was a, it was a total trial, we didn't know if it was going to work, so we put it, you know, we, we made it for 15, he went over budget 2, he said, can I get 2, so we said sure, and got for 17. When, when we released the record, it was, it was not the best sounding record in the world. It was better than most that was out there that was doing the same thing, but it wasn't what Maranatha was used to putting out. And so I got in trouble for that, because um, it, was it wasn't up to the standards that we normally did. Um, but the record went gold. It sold 500,000 units. So at, after it went gold, because they told me it wouldn't sell because it sounded to, so terrible, but after it went gold, then they were saying, that was amazing, let's do another one. So, uh, <laughs> so at first, they did not like the fact that we were thinking different and creative and just trying to do something that, was going to, that we thought would succeed. Um, but when it succeeded, then we were amazing. So you, know, you want to be creative, but understand you're at great risk for being creative until it really, you're amazing, then you'll be amazing. Um, and the other thing is to be diverse. I've told my son this. He's a, he started out as a drummer, um, but he plays guitar and bass, and he's, he's more of a producer. He can, actually has a producer's mind. Um, but I said, learn as many different skills as you can. So if you're a guitar player, learn piano. You know, if you're a piano player, learn guitar, learn bass, learn other instruments. If, you, if you're a musician, Learn how to engineer. Learn how to get sounds out of a board. You know, if you're if you're in good at all those things, learn about marketing. Learn how to get the songs out there. Learn about promotion. Always be learning in this business because you're going to be in it uh, for the rest of your life. You know, I really don't believe that music is something you can ever take out of you. So you know, it, it, once it's in you, it's in you for life. And so you want to expand and grow in that as much as you can. If you're in church music. You know, learn about the ministry, learn how to counsel people, learn how to learn theology, learn, you know, uh, learn to expand your knowledge of, of church history and how churches work and how different models of, of doing things. Learn about drama and video and all this and radio. You know, I started out in my, my uh, the first church I was full time in, not only as a worship leader, but I also produced the radio program. And the reason why I became the radio producer is because I knew Pro Tools because of working in studios at Maranatha Music. So it just kind of, you know, they said, oh, since you know how to do that, you're a radio producer. Now, I couldn't tell them, no, I'm not a radio producer. You know, even though I wasn't, I didn't know what I was doing. But that I just kept an open mind and I learned a new skill. And I had my friend come and give me a crash course and all the shortcuts and Pro Tools and <laughs> off we were going. And so I just learned a new skill. You know, now as a senior pastor, every church has got to have a killer website, so now I've become a web designer. You know, I didn't want to be a web designer, I still don't want to be a web designer, but it's just, I've just had to learn this skill because it's what you got to do, right? You want to kind of keep moving on. So you want to be diverse and learn as many skills as you can and, and always keep that um, open heart to be a learner of new things. and and just meet as many people as you can and be a cool person. And you'll do well. So that's it. <laughs> yes? Um, if you were to compare uh, today uh, to when you started, like how would the worship world look? And also, like uh, in terms of the changes, is it good or is it bad? <coughs> Well, 
I think the opportunities are so much greater today uh, because there are, like I said, there's so many more platforms, especially if you're at a local church. Most local churches video stream everything they do. Um, and so you have, an, you know, for a developing artist, someone that doesn't have a platform, um, you hands down at being on a church platform have an advantage over every secular band that's out there. Because most bands are fighting for limited venues to play in, and so they might play once or once a quarter at a certain certain thing. And if you're like you're scoring, if you can get a, a weekly gig in a secular environment, but in a Christian environment at a church, um, you have incredible you know opportunities to be seen and heard on a weekly basis. Um, that's why like Integrity Music right now with the global worship. Um, they've essentially stopped signing artists, they're signing churches. Because they realize that churches have become the, the new center for developing uh, worship artists. So like Elevation Church, Stephen Furtick's church um, was signed. Um, uh, that was kind of more of a recent thing, but um, like New Life Church was mm -hmm. like one of the first ones signed, Gateway Church. Um, there's like a bunch of other ones that are coming up, you know, so um, some of my friends are, are they're being looked at right now um, by, uh, by Global Worship, you know, uh, um, Rebel Church out in um, uh, Miami Beach, Florida. So there's like, you know, they're, look, they're recognizing that the church really is the venue for talent to be developed. And so they're <laughs> looking at kind of the bigger churches that are making a scene. So. If you're really looking for a platform, I would say look at your local church because that's really where the record companies are looking right now. When they sign a church, how does that work? Do they just apply the church funding and the church is supposed to um, distribute that kind of funding towards you or your worship or promotion? No, a lot of times they'll come in and they'll either license the project or they'll, they'll come in and pay for the project, pay for the production of it, the recording of it. And then, um, and then it's a standard, you know, songwriting agreement with all the writers on it. But they work through the local church to do that. And if it's a church ministry like a Gateway or an Elevation Church or a Hillsong, although Integrity lost Hillsong, um, they'll, uh, you know, they'll they'll look at doing multiple projects with that church. You know, so that's essentially what we started doing with um, when we launched Worship uh, Underground is we were looking at churches. So we signed Resurrection Life Church. Kirk Coffield was the worship leader there. He became the worship leader at Promise Keepers. And then Integrity Music signed them. And it kind of became a bigger thing after that. So does that make sense? Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. And